working at speeds that are hardly imaginable, and on technologies that will sustain us for generations to come. From the smallest possible scales to the expanse of our solar system and the depths of our oceans, connecting the world around us and to one another. For more than 75 years, SRI has had a profound impact on virtually every one of our lives, creating and delivering transformative technologies that have kept us healthier, safer, and more secure. Groundbreaking innovations and ideas that have enriched all of our lives. At home, at work, at school, and at play. From our home in the heart of Silicon Valley and our offices and labs throughout the United States and in Japan, we invite you to learn about SRI's rich legacy of innovation. As we continue to lean toward the future, discovering and developing the next generation of transformative technologies, services, products, and ideas, bringing the extraordinary to reality, and defining the endless possibilities ahead. Great, thank you, and welcome all of you to a special edition of Park Forum. We're very happy to welcome so many special guests. Uh, we have so many VIPs and Park alumni and SRI leadership, and all of us are gathered here in person and also online on Zoom. And we're all here to celebrate our history, but also these the, some of the most transformative technologies of our era. My name is Lawrence Lee, and I'm very honored to be your MC this afternoon. So, of course, we need to start with just a little bit of housekeeping to start. First, please, no flash photography. Uh, the second is, in the event of an emergency or natural disaster, please go out the way that you came in, out through these double doors back here, back up the stairs into the parking lot. We're also using a digital program today. So if you were able to scan a QR code on the way in, you are able to see our full agenda, uh, speaker bios, and some more information on SRI um, and on our work. And then also, uh, I invite you to sign up for the newsletter, um, and then you can learn more about all the research and commercialization uh, work that's going on here. Um, and also, you may have gotten a postcard, an innovation postcard, and a pencil when you came in. We're going to use that to have you uh, be able to write down questions for our panel later. So if you have a question, uh, write it down, and then we'll have uh, Kelly and Stacy kind of walk down the aisles, be able to collect them so you can pass them to the end of the aisles. Um, and then if you, uh, but if you need um, a card or a pencil, you can also um, kind of get their attention as well. They'll be walking up and down the aisles kind of occasionally uh, throughout the event. Okay, so let's get started. Uh, you know, first, I'd like to kick things off by introducing SRI's CEO, David Parrott. David became CEO in 2021, and he has more than 30 years of experience leading research for both industrial and academic institutions, including United Technologies, Georgia Tech, Boeing, and others. Um, he, was a, he earned his PhD from Stanford and brings a passion for technology uh, that he brings to us in, in his role as CEO every day. So please welcome David to the stage. Thank you, Lawrence. Uh, let me just add my welcome. I'm delighted to have all of you here join us. Uh, and I think about all the advances today that are on your shoulders, many of you. And uh, we're going to celebrate three of them, very specially today. Um, and when you think about SRI, SRI was founded, as many of you know, in 46, at Stanford Research Institute, spun out in 1970 as an independent nonprofit, and has been joined by two other iconic research institutions. Uh, in 87, the Sarnoff Labs in Princeton, uh, joined as part of SRI and most recently really excited just last year. So just almost a year ago, uh, Xerox Park and Park joining SRI. And if you think of the three together, so many innovations. In fact, after today, three IEEE milestone awards related to these institutions. And we look back on inflection points in history and how that has been made possible by the work of these organizations and particularly today celebrating that of Park. And also what's exciting is today we have over 1,500 researchers in the US and Japan, multiple sites, identifying what the next inflection points are. As we think about 
the third phase in many ways with regard to AI and how it can impact so many areas of our world, but also things related to precision medicine, uh, things related to advanced manufacturing, uh, what we do with regard to really leveraging the power of quantum as we think not only of computing, but sensing. And if you think about what we're celebrating today in terms of the inventions that enabled back then, the future of the office, which we use today, and we think about how things have gotten so remote, we're re-envisioning the future of both work and education going forward. That's not necessarily about being in a place, but how we connect, how we think, how we collaborate. And I think very much in sort of the history of both SRI and Park, thinking about the computer, not just as a cool tool and how you interact with it, but how it's a way for people to use that as a resource to connect and address some of the world's most challenging problems. And as I was listening to all the buzz in the room, I thought of one more historical piece that maybe we've forgotten as we're all on monitors, and that's the buzz in the room. Uh, so really delighted that people are here because for all the connection we can have over the network, there's just no substitute for the in-person connection that we're gonna celebrate today. So I hope you connect with each other, uh, renew that, and then maybe some of this becomes a catalyst for new ideas going forward. This is our second park forum. This was started in 77. It was put on hiatus in 2019. We're delighted to relaunch it uh, because it's a mechanism by which we can bring the community together uh, with thought leaders from around the world, Nobel Prize winners, Turing Award winners, uh, Pulitzer Prize winning journalists and other key people driving how we think about innovation and some of the interesting challenges of our day. And so we're delighted that on the second one uh, with the relaunch, partnering with IEEE to have this very special uh, milestone event. Uh, so with that, uh, turn it back over to Lawrence so he can do, introduce our keynote speakers for today. Lawrence. Great, thank you, David. So next up is our first keynote speaker, Vint Cerf. Vint is Vice President and Chief Internet Evangelist at Google. He is referred to as one of the fathers of the internet for his role in designing TCP IP and the architecture of the internet. Uh, Vint, uh, for which actually he earned the Presidential Medal of Freedom. Uh, Vint went on to found the uh, Internet Society and also served as president of ICANN, the organization that operates the domain naming uh, system. He's had many ties to Park um, and Park people, um, and a lot of his work overlapped, a lot of the work that was here. So we're very pleased to have him here to be able to talk about his work and be able to celebrate with us. Uh, please welcome Ben to the stage. Thank you, Lawrence. Thank you. Well, first of all, this is kind of amazing. I can't see any of you, but when the lights when the lights were up, I could see a room full of old farts. It was absolutely amazing. I predict that most of us are going to wander over and say, "Didn't you used to be?" And um, so it's it, actually this is just a wonderful opportunity to reconnect with so many of you uh, that have contributed in many ways to exactly what we're celebrating today. Uh, I'm not a uh, former Xerox Park person, so I feel like I'm a little bit of an interloper. But uh, I would like to offer some context because the design and implementation of the internet was strongly influenced by the things that happened at Xerox Park. This is all very much uh, contemporary activity. And uh, as there will be more milestones celebrated this week, more on Sunday and then again on Monday at the Computer History Museums. So this is an extraordinary uh, week or so of days for those of you who have been part of this story for so many years. Uh, I have a few slides here that uh, might be of interest. This is a picture of the uh, celebrate. Oh, wait a minute, did, did we get that right? Yeah, I guess that's right. So in 1994, the ARPANET uh, uh, anniversary, third, would have been the um, 25th anniversary of the uh, ARPANET, and we celebrated at Bolt, Baranek, and Newman, the company that made the packet switches, the so-called interface message processors. So this was a Newsweek magazine um, photo. It took us all day to set this up. You know, they're drawing all this stuff, and we had to go go find the zucchinis and the yellow squash and the yellow cable and five pound tins of coffee we had to empty out. And this is this was in. Um, uh, 1994, we decided to make this a geek joke. And if you look carefully, you'll see it's mouth to mouth and ear to ear. This network would never have worked. 
you know, that, so that was, and I, not too many people noticed. It was a lot of fun. So many of you uh, in this room were part of the ARPANET story. Uh, I was a graduate student at UCLA working on the Sigma-7. The first node was installed in September of uh, 1969. The second one was in October of 1969 up at SRI. So it's very appropriate that we're standing here and now what is now SRI territory. Uh, that first connection was made in October of uh, 1969. Uh, the Sigma-7 is in a museum now and some people think I should be there too, but here, <laughs> but here I am. So uh, anyway, uh, the, the important thing is that, that this development was part of the um, threads that uh, also emerged out of the Xerox Park activity, which was absolutely dramatic, as you will see as time goes on in this session. Uh, this is what a packet switch looked like in 1969. It was delivered to UCLA around Labor Day, and it was in a very heavy metal case with some, with some uh, uh, hooks on the top as if it might be dropped in by helicopter. The reason that this was delivered with such you know, dense material is they knew it was going into extremely hostile territory. A bunch of graduate students were surrounding it. And anyone who's dealt with graduate students knows how hostile they can be. Uh, and he, this is very important because the ARPANET development showed that we could make different computers talk to each other with a standard set of protocols. But Bob Kahn uh, realized when he went to ARPA in late 1972, that this technology could be expanded and used for command and control in the, in the uh, military. But in order to do that, you need to deal with mobile vehicles, ships at sea, and aircraft. And you can, this ARPANET was built with dedicated telephone circuits connecting the packet switches. But if you try to you know, connect the airplanes that way, they can't get off the tarmac, and the tanks run over the wires, and the ships get all tangled up. So he had to move to radio, and so he had a packet radio system under development by Collins Radio uh, and outfitting uh, uh, here at SRI, the mobile vehicles, the uh, radio repeaters on the mountaintops, and this um, nondescript packet radio van, which, by the way, is uh, at the Computer History Museum now. And I, I'm not quite sure how many of you in the audience ever saw this, but the story is that... Um, we would drive up and down the, the Bayshore Freeway and occasionally stop. And the engineers would get out from the cab and go into the back where we had all the equipment to measure shot noise and error rates and things like that. And there's a story about one day the police noticed this nondescript unmarked van with a stacked dipole array antenna sticking out the top. And, and he, nobody's in the cab, so he goes and bangs on the back door. The doors open up. And he sees all these geeky-looking guys with beards and you know displays and you know computers. And, and he says, who are you? And uh, somebody says, well, we work for the government. <laughs> and, and the guy says, which government? But, but officer, we were only going 50 kilobits per second. <laughs> this was a very, very important development, though. Uh, and it stemmed out of the Aloha network that had been done earlier at the University of Hawaii. And we will be celebrating Ethernet. And that also, that concept stemmed from a visit that Bob Metcalf made uh, at, to uh, the University of Hawaii. Uh, but he figured out how to do that on a coaxial cable at a hell of a lot faster speed than they were doing it there. But the radio connection was super important uh, at, this, at this point. So this is what the ARPANET looked like uh, a bit longer. And you'll see that Xerox Park was up on the network certainly by 1973. And I think this is very important for a couple of reasons. First of all, Park was, is not far away from Stanford University. I was uh, at Stanford when Bob Kahn and I started working on the internet design. And we had students who were working at Park and we had Park people coming to Stanford to, uh, to take classes and also to participate in a seminar on networking. So it's very important uh, to acknowledge that Park had strong influence on some of the things that went on in my class. The satellite network was also part of Bob's um, idea because for ships at sea, we needed long distance communication. So we had a packet satellite net 
over the Atlantic using Intelsat 4A with multiple ground stations contending for access to the uh, uh, synchronous satellite, geosynchronous satellite uh, over the Atlantic. So I want to acknowledge that the Park Universal Packet idea, which Metcalf and Schock and others who are here participated in, uh, they influenced a lot of our thinking, but they had to do it in a very subtle way because um, they were not allowed to talk openly about the work they were doing. Xerox wanted to keep it proprietary. And so in the seminars, uh, John Schock would make hints about things that didn't work, It'd try to get us to pay attention to things like that uh, without exactly telling us what was going on with, with Park Universal Packet. Now, eventually that morphed into the Xerox network system, uh, which uh, saw significant use for a while uh, in uh, in other systems, but uh, we weren't able to, uh, to, they weren't able to share all the details with us, but it helped us a lot. Now, since I have a few minutes left, um, I, I wanted to share a few anecdotes uh, with you uh, about uh, this experiment. First of all, um, I have to say that, that because we were starting to deal with radio and, uh, and uh, the park folks were telling us about the Ethernet, all of those technologies were lossy. And the protocols that were originally designed for the ARPANET assumed absolute uh, success in the network. And of course, you don't get that in the radio environment. So the TCP IP protocols had to recover end to end for packet loss. And so it was helpful for us to have three different technologies, packet radio, packet satellite, and ethernet that drove in the direction of end to end uh, recovery. Uh, from packet loss and disorderly arrival, and in some cases, duplicated arrival. Second thing that I would observe is that as uh, PARC continued to explore potential applications that you'll hear more about today and you all remember, uh, they were living 20 years in the future, as near as I could tell, with the Alto machine, the laser printer, uh, with the bitmap displays, uh, the mouse, all of those things, and the ethernet, of course. All of those things really placed those 250 or so people in two decades into the future. And I think as we look back on that, we can, we can be in awe of what they were able to accomplish. Uh, now, it turns out that another important element of all this is the commercialization of these technologies. And in the case of uh, Ethernet, Bob Metcalf, as many of you will remember, uh, left Xerox Park to start a company called 3Com, which is all about computer communications and compatibility. And the thing that's important there is that once these technologies become commercially available, they become much more accessible to the private sector to the, and to the research community. And it, it frankly stimulated university campuses to network themselves. Uh, the National Science Foundation encouraged that networking. And of course, there was another element that was particularly helpful, and that was the in installation of TCP IP into the Unix operating system. Now, here comes anecdote number one. Metcalf was really pissed off that Google, I'm sorry, Google, that ARPA funded, sorry, I get mixed, uh, yeah, senior moment, senior moment. He was pissed off that ARPA paid um, Bolt, Baranek, and Newman to put TCP IP into the Unix operating system. What was supposed to happen is that the Berkeley guys were supposed to put the, the uh, BBN version into BSD 4.2. Bill Joy took one look at the code, and although I wasn't around to observe, he decided to write his own. So, he, uh, so they released a version uh, of uh, the uh, Unix operating system with that now, and the reason that Metcalf was pissed off is that he had just spent money to get TCP IP into Unix for 3Com in order to make the Ethernet. And he pissed, he really got angry at me. He said that he lost a lot of money and mumble. And then later he admitted they made about a million bucks out of that. So, uh, but but that wasn't enough for Bob. Um, he decided to. He, he decided to get even uh, a little later, and he decided to predict that the internet was going to suffer a gigalapse. And some of you will remember, he published this article, it was all going to collapse, he tried to name a date, and then it didn't. And uh, to his credit, he agreed that, uh, that he would eat his words. And so on stage, he took a blender and he put the newspaper into the blender and he poured some water in, 
and, and blended it all up and he ate it right there on the stage. <laughs> now, Bob is no idiot and, and he checked first to make sure that this wasn't toxic. So, but nonetheless, uh, I want to thank Bob for uh, all of his contributions and the many other contributions we'll learn about today. This is a moment to remember a 50th anniversary of many of, the, of these uh, inventions and developments. We can only imagine, given where we are today in technology, what this might be like 50 years from now. I just wish I was eight years old because I'd like to find out what actually happens right now. All we can do is guess. So thank you all for coming. Thank you. Thank you, Ben, for sharing those stories. And it's a great transition to our next keynote speaker, Bob Metcalf. Uh, Bob is a 2022 uh, ACM Turing Award winner, and of course is best known for the invention, standardization, and commercialization of Ethernet, um, including founding 3Com, as Ben noted. Um, Ethernet was the world's first open local error network standard, and of course, an integral part of our lives still today. Um, Bob spent six years here at Park, from 1973 to 1978, and we are honored to have him back here on campus to talk about his work. So please welcome Bob to the stage. Thank you. So you try following Vint Cerf speaking about the internet. Uh, I'm here because I'm a big fan of innovation, and I and we have an example of a, a very successful innovation, namely Ethernet, and I think we should learn as much as we can from that as an example. Um, now, some people even ask, what is Ethernet after 50 years? Uh, is it the CSMA CD half-inch coax 2.94 megabit per second Ethernet that Dave Boggs and I, may he rest in peace, built here at uh, Xerox Park. And, uh, and I'll tell you later what it really was. Uh, we, we chose uh, three technologies for that first Ethernet, the one I just touched on. We had Gerald Taps for punctuating the co uh, coaxial cable. We had Manchester encoding so that our packets carried their own clocks and didn't need to be clocked. And we borrowed the Aloha network. Well, we didn't borrow. We failed to give it back, actually. We, we, borrow, we borrowed the uh, Aloha network randomized retransmissions. And that, uh, that was the technology set for the first Ethernet, but it's not what Ethernet is today. And I'm going to return to that point in a moment. Uh, Ethernet was developed under constraints. Uh, for example, uh, uh, it had to fit on a card with 60 to 80 chips on it. These were 7,400 series TI chips. It had to fit on that card. Another constraint is it had to be finished and working in 1973. And uh, th these two facts, for example, uh, together answer the question, why did the first Ethernet run at 2.94 megabits per second? I mean, three would have been a good number. <laughs> And the answer is, David and I couldn't find a place to put a crystal on the card. And we noticed that the Alto had a clock on the back plane. So we ran our wire wrapped over there to that clock and used it to clock our bits in and out of the shift registers. And they, uh, that was a 340 nanosecond bit, which turns out to be 2.94 megabits per second. So the speed of the Ethernet was determined by the constraints. And we were in a hurry, by the way. We had to finish by the end of 73. Um, after we built the thing, there was, there was competition inside of Xerox. The first of which was SneakerNet. I don't need a network. I can just put on my sneakers and carry the diskette over to the printer. Yeah. And it usually takes a month to grow out of that. But anyway, we, you should, we should get a plaque. We invented Command P. The other, another competitor was Signet, Simone's infinitely glorious network. 
it existed prior to my arrival at Park. It ran at 50, no, it was going to run at 50 uh, megabits per second, pattern much over after the ARPANET. And as soon as I got there, Butler Lamson convinced Charles to stop work on Signet and work on a, a text editor called Bravo, which became Microsoft Word, which is why uh, Charles is the fourth billionaire out of Microsoft. But I got to do the network. And then there was XNet. So uh, my, my uh, good friend Chuck Thacker got worried that David and I, uh, may he rest in peace, that uh, David uh, Boggs and I would not finish in time to have a network for all those PCs he was building. So he, st of course, he started work on his own network as a, as a backup. It was called XNet. And I managed to convince Bob Taylor to convince Chuck Thacker to give that up. So the in inside competition was killed. Uh, things to learn. One thing I learned is don't work alone. So David Liddell, who's sitting right over there, I approached David and I said, you have a grad student, Boggs, David Boggs, who doesn't seem to be fully employed. Will you give him to me to work on this project? And David, thank you, David. A good thing just happened. Usually when I tell a story with David in it, he denies that it happened. <laughs> so he gave me Boggs, and Boggs and I were like this for two years, uh, building Ethernet and its implications, uh, and I miss David. Uh, not Liddell, David. Uh, uh, so don't work alone. You generate too many errors. The layering of the Internet, brilliant idea helped us build the damn thing. Uh, uh, it just adds a great deal of simplicity. So my company got to live at the lower levels of the internet while uh, the other companies made the billions up here at the higher levels of the network. Um, uh, protocols, you build all this hardware that moves pa packets around, but then you need protocols. And that's, we were in a rush. So I'm sorry, Vint, we did build PUP and, and X and S and, uh, and for a while, oh, but, but 3Com also shipped the first commercial version of TCP IP. Uh, it was called UNIT. Uh, and we co-announced it with Microsoft in 1980. And the, Microsoft was going to put our UNIT into their strategic operating system, which was called what? Well, that's what we thought. Xenix is what it was called. So they thought e Unix was going to be their strategic part. So it made sense for our Unix TCP to go into Microsoft's. And of course, a year later, they announced DOS uh, and abandoned Xenix immediately. So then we uh, we had to go along. We went along with uh, XNS for a while, like Nobel, our arch competitor, also used it. Um, so what is Ethernet? I'm almost done now. Uh, I think it's a brand, and I'm the brand manager. Uh, and what an Ethernet product is, is it's, uh, it works. It's uh, internet native. It's built to carry IP packets. It's uh, made using de jure standards. Ethernet went through IEEE 802. Dot three, very important to the brand to be de jure. Uh, backward compatible with the install base, so as not to abandon the install base, but to leverage the install base. Fierce competition, interoperability, uh, and build it and they will come. So there's guys across town here building 800 gigabit per second ethernet. And I don't have any use for that in my home. Um, but that, what I just enumerated there is uh, my view of the brand. That when you buy an Ethernet product, you expect it to have those characteristics. And th there's also a cheat associated with this. is Whenever a new technology comes along to replace Ethernet, they have a meeting. And the marketing guys come. And they say, what are we going to call our product? And they realize the smartest thing in the world is to call it Ethernet. 
<laughs> so, so Ethernet is never going to be replaced. It's just going to evolve. Uh, okay, so I'm going to end by telling you the three things that Ethernet did that weren't Gerald Manchester Aloha Network. So you all think that's what Ethernet is, but no, because first of all, those three technologies are no longer operative. They're long gone. So there's other stuff running there. But here's the three things that Ethernet did do. One is it brought packets to the desktop. Prior to Ethernet, the packets went to the host, typically a PDP-10, and uh, which ran an app and sent characters to your dumb terminal. And after Ethernet, the packets went all the way to your desktop so you could write your own network applications as I think a guy named Tim Berners-Lee did one of those. Did a, an app that he put on top of the packet uh, APIs of uh, Ethernet equipped machines. The second thing that Ethernet did, accomplished, contributed, uh, was abundance of bandwidth. The Ethernet installed in my Xerox workstation, not far from here, was 40,000 times faster than the network that it replaced. And maybe it was only 10,000. Not 10% faster. No one thought that that's what I said. Not double. 10,000 times faster, ending uh, bandwidth scarcity. So f after Ethernet, we changed our mindset about bandwidth, and it became abundant. And finally, uh, Ethernet joined the standards movement. The Internet is a standards movement, TCP, IP, and we tucked Ethernet right in the back of that as an IEEE 802 uh, standard. And thank you, IEEE. Um, and we're going to have a chance in the next couple of days to thank 802 more directly. So thanks very much. Great. Thank you, Bob, for sharing those stories. And it is really interesting to think about how the brand, I think, really enabled such a community to be able to have Ethernet scale and, and continue to go strong more than 50 years later. It's really, it's really amazing. Thank you. Um, so now I'd like to um, be able to uh, introduce um, IEEE. First, the president of IEEE, Tom Coughlin. Uh, Tom has served in numerous IEEE. You can come on up. Yep, IEEE uh, volunteer leadership roles, including president of IEEE USA, director of IEEE Region 6, VP and board member of the IEEE Consumer Technology Society, and more. And an IEEE Life Fellow, Dr. Coughlin holds six patents. Um, so coming up, and then also following Tom's talk, Brian Berg will come to the stage to tell us about the IEEE Milestone Program, which is the awards that we're honoring today. Uh, Brian's active as an IEEE officer in the Santa Clara Valley section and Region 6, and internationally as Vice Chair of the History Committee and Chair of the IEEE Milestones Subcommittee. So please welcome Tom and Brian, and thank we'll you. start from there. Thank right. you. Right, thank you. Do I need this if I've got that? I don't think I need this. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I'll go and start the video. Oh, yeah. You yeah. start the video. Yep. Great. Thank you much. I'm not sure I could do quite the job that, uh, that Vint and, uh, and Bob did, but I do want to uh, say hello, everyone. Uh, good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for this uh, uh, SRI's historic park campus and uh, for being a part of this special uh, dedication ceremony. So I've been looking forward to today for, uh, for quite some time, and I'm really pleased to be able to participate as IEEE president. And I'd like to thank uh, uh, Dave, uh, Dave Perrick for hosting us today, and um, I'm honored to be joined by Vint, Bob, as well as uh, Ron Ryder and John, uh, John Schock and my longtime IEEE milestone collaborator, Brian Berg. So IEEE is an association dedicated to a clear and simple mission, advancing innovation and technological excellence for the benefit of humanity. One way to do this is by helping our members and also the general public to understand that te how technology can be used to solve important problems, improve standards of living, and provide solutions to such critical issues as ethical and sustainable design, climate change, reliable energy, and bridging the digital divide to connect the unconnected. So as the world's largest technical professional society, IEEE serves professionals involved in all aspects of the electrical, electronic, 
communications and computing fields, and across the related areas of science and technology that underpin our modern civilization. This includes electrical and electronic engineers and the technology, technologists from the fields of computer science and information technology, as well as those in physical and applied sciences, biological and medical sciences, mathematics, as well as those advance, advancing applications to and considering the implications of our profession, such as technical communication, history, ma uh, education, management, law, and policy. In more than 190 countries, IEEE members come together as part of the international professional community. Our worldwide membership of more than 460,000 members is the heart of the IEEE. This includes more than 171,000 student members who are critically important as the future of our professions. As a global network, we provide unique opportunities to connect experts. There you go, that's a good one. And shape cutting edge research around the globe. And we work to foster and grow top technical talent worldwide. So IEEE is a uh, world leading publisher of trusted high quality technical information a principal organizer of international conferences, the leading advocate for education in engineering and computing, and a developer of widely used international standards. So we currently publish over 200 transactions, journals, and magazines. We archive and distribute publications through the IEEE platform. These are interesting pictures going of this, and, uh, which includes more than uh, 6 million articles. Each month, researchers download over 15 million articles from Explore. Our data port research data repository currently has over seven and a half billion users. IEEE convenes more than 2,000 annual conferences and events worldwide, and these events serve to bring researchers together to discuss and, uh, and critique work in progress, to network and connect with collaboration, collaborators, and to accelerate discovery in current and emerging technical fields. We play a ma major role in advancing education, increasing the public's understanding of our fields through support for pre-university STEM education programs, advancing university education in engineering and computing, supporting curriculum innovation and development, enabling university accreditation, and providing our members for a long time for lifelong technical and professional education needed to advance their skills in the face of fast-moving technologies. So as a leading producer of standards, which talked about 802 before, IEEE has been committed to standards development for over a century and to shaping the trajectory of technologies through our engagement in international standardization. IEEE standards impact the offerings of entire industrial sectors, as we talk today, hoping, helping to ensure safety, interoperability, and compatibility of the products and systems used by billions of people around the world, including the electricity we rely upon to light this room and the networking that is the backbone of modern communication. IEEE also plays a vital role in shaping our profession and our communities through our contributions to the larger societal conversation on critical matters and through our engagement uh, in informing public policy. So our legacy is a story of innovation and collaboration. In fact, uh, this year we're celebrating our 140th anniversary. And that's because our roots go back to 1884, when electricity first began to have a major influence on society. That, there was one uh, main established electrical industry, the telegraph, which since the 1840s had come to connect the world with a data communication system faster than the speed of physical transportation. In 1884, uh, the telephone and electric power and light industries had just gotten underway. In the spring of 1884, a small group of individuals in the electrical professions met in New York City they formed a new organization to, to support professionals in their emerging fields and to aid them in their efforts to apply innovation for the betterment of humanity, the American Institute of Electrical Engineers, or AIEE for short. That October, uh, that organization held its first technical meeting in Philadelphia. So a lot of early uh, founders uh, came from telegraphy, telegraphy. Others like Thomas Edison came from power, while Alexander Graham Bell represented the telephone industry. Electric power spread rapidly, enhancing the innovations uh, such as induction motors, long distance AC uh, transmission, larger power plants, and many, many industries. So in, in 1895, a new industry arose, beginning with uh, Guglielmo Marconi's wireless telegraphy experiments. What was originally called wireless telegraphy became radio with the uh, electrical amplification possibilities inherent in the vacuum tubes that evolved from John Fleming's diode and Lee DeForest triode. 
And in 1812, the Institute of Radio Engineers was formed. So uh, over the decades that followed, uh, well, in 1963, these two organizations got together and they merged to form the current IEEE. So we have roots both in communication and power and many other technologies. And over the decades that followed with our leadership, uh, the societal roles of technology uh, continue to spread around the world and impact more areas of people's lives. Um, since that time, also computers evolved from massive mainframes to develop appliances to portable devices linked by global networks connected by copper wire, microwaves, satellites, or fiber optics. Electronics became ubiquitous, integrated in everything from jet cockpits to industrial robots to medical imaging and eyeglasses. As technologies and the industries that developed them increasingly transcended national boundaries, IEEE has been keeping pace, becoming a truly global institution which uses the innovations of the practitioners it represents to enhance its own excellence in delivering products and services to, to help our members, industry, and the public at large. Today, we continue to be at the forefront of technological revolutions in energy, communications, computing, and the underlying disciplines of, in hardware and software that have supported these technological advances in the many fields of application and industrial activities, consumer products, transportation, medicine, and many other domains that have shaped our modern standard of living. So our field has fundamentally changed the, the way the people uh, communicate, the way we work, the way we move, learn, heal, create, in short, the way we live and the way we've been able to deal with disasters such as uh, the COVID pandemic. So regardless of their genesis, these different advances didn't happen in a vacuum. Well, maybe some of them did, like those tubes. But creative inspiration and, and diligent endeavor require context, memory, and support. Throughout the past 140 years, the IEEE has been there to provide these ingredients, that fertile ground from which these achievements can flourish. Our various technical communities have brought the best minds in engineering together, created the spaces where they can share their work and cultivate innovators, entrepreneurs, teachers, and leaders to advance technology for the benefit of humanity. Over nearly a century and a half, electrical engineering has grown from a largely theoretical branch of physics to a pastime for driven eccentrics, and then finally, to a thriving profession that has changed the world. As it did so, it produced and nurtured brilliant innovators and industries of incalculable value. Throughout it all, IEEE members and their colleagues, supported by IEEE conferences, publications, standards, recognition, educational activities, and professional communities, have produced innumerable discoveries and inventions that have, that have uh, led to the world we live in today. From humble beginnings, IEEE has grown into a global institution, the world's largest technical profession organization dedicated to advancing technology again for the benefit of humanity. So as we celebrate our 140th year, we're gonna to continue to engage and support the technologies that are making enormous strides in fields such as electric vehicles, semiconductors, alternative energy and grid technologies, biomedical systems, space exploration, uh, AI, among many uh, emerging uh, fields of endeavor. So as I wrap up, I'd like to sincerely thank everybody again for your participation here today. Our professions have a long, rich, and important history. And it is essential that pioneering technological developments and discoveries and the women and men behind them are preserved for generations to come. It is an important part of IEEE's mission to preserve the legacy and the heritage of our professions, to recognize great achievements, and to promote the importance and impact of engineering so as to inspire the next generation of technologists. By celebrating the pride and prestige of our professions, we demonstrate how engineers, scientists, and technologists contribute to our global community and have helped to build today's technologically innovative world. They have shaped the trajectory of technology, our communities, and institutions. Their stories, their lessons should be told and retold. And the anecdotes we, that we're just hearing about, as long as human beings strive to make the world a better place. So with that, um, I'm very honored to be part of this celebration. It's a fitting celebration, I think, of our community success and an inspiration for the next 140 years. Thank you. As Ryan is coming up, I just want to do a quick make a quick reminder. If you have a question, please go ahead and write it on a card, and then Kelly and Stacey will be able to get that from you. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Ryan. Great. Thank you very much. Yep.
Hello, everybody. Happy to have you all here. So let's see. So I've been working with Milestone since 2010, and I get to have fun and meet cool people in the process. I've been involved with <laughs> been involved with about two dozen of these so far. In the in the audience here is Dick Ahrens. He's the one who first turned me on to doing this. We were walking around Flash Memory Summit back in 2010 and realizing that the work that Eli Harari had done with regard to the EE prime that led to flash memory was worthy of a milestone. And so that was the first milestone that I got to work on, and that got me hooked. So um, with regard to all this, we want to thank uh, IEEE for IEEE.tv for streaming today. They're also going to be streaming events on both Sunday and Monday. We've got an event that's been referenced uh, that's going to be taking place at the Computer History Museum. That event is currently sold out, but it can be streamed, and you can... Uh, if you don't want to write anything down, just remember IEEE TV dot IEEE dot org, and you'll get links to all three of those events, including uh, the ability to get a video of today's event as well. So we've been talking about various standards uh, at that event uh, on next Monday. There's three more milestones that are going to be dedicated. One is going to be for the IEEE 802 Standards Committee, the ones who manage Ethernet, Wi-Fi, and, and other standards. Also for the TCP paper that Bob uh, Kahn and Vince Cerf wrote and was published in 1974, as well as for the birth of Google in 1998 and their PageRank algorithm. So those three will be dedicated next, next Monday. Uh, with regard to the uh, milestones that we'll be learning about today, I want to um, acknowledge the expert reviewers who ensured the uh, accuracy of the uh, information in those proposals. For the Alto, there was Chuck House, who's watching this event online. Robert Sprawl, also online, and Dag Spicer, who I believe is in the audience uh, from the Computer History Museum. For the laser printer, we had John Schock, who we'll be hearing from, as well as Jeff Thompson, who's here in the audience. And for Ethernet, Len Schustek, who's uh, Chairman Emeritus of the Computer History Museum, as well as Mark Weber. So here's an example of a milestone that's been uh, located at Qualcomm. This was dedicated uh, about five years ago, and anybody who comes to Qualcomm is met by this milestone. A visitor will see that milestone right in front of them before they even enter the building. This is an example of how proud uh, uh, companies and entities that receive these milestone recognitions are of these. And SRI visitors will be greeted similarly, as will be seen after the event today. So here's a few examples of some of the milestones that have been dedicated since 1984. Uh, Bletchley code breaking, the CD audio player, the bullet train in uh, Japan. Japan is very active in the milestone uh, program. They've got, uh, I think, a couple dozen milestones in Japan and more coming along as well. So I've been, been, uh, had the ability to work with some of the folks in Japan, and they're very serious about this, and they want to get all the information very accurate. And so we really respect them for that. So here are the uh, nine milestones now that um, SRI has. We're, uh, we've got the three that are being dedicated today, and it's already been mentioned with regard to three that are from um, uh, uh, David Sarnoff Labs in Princeton. That's the Taros-1 weather satellite, as well as the color television and the, um, uh, let's see, liquid crystal displays. And then the three that are dedicated uh, over at SRI are for um, Shaky the Robot, Mother of All Demos, and the first um, ARPANET transmission from UCLA to SRI. So here's uh, the plaque uh, for that uh, first ARPANET transmission. If you look on the right, you'll see the three plaques that are in the entryway at, at SRI labs over in Menlo Park. And then these are the first four nodes on the left, and initially went from UCLA to SRI. Another one that was already mentioned, the Mother of All Demos. A uh, little interesting detail, Stuart Brand, who uh, edited the whole Earth Catalog and also founded the Well and the Long Now Foundation, was actually the assistant stage manager for that. He's the guy who actually managed the camera that took a picture of the image for the screen for a Xerox computer that was sent via microwave up to San Francisco and then Doug, Engel, Doug uh, Engelbart up there would be clicking on his mouse and moving it, those transmission signals would travel over a telephone line back to SRI. So that was how they did the demo in San Francisco. Amazing event in and of itself, not to mention what he was demonstrating. Now, the, we've also been hearing a little bit about, in the intro slides from Tom Coughlin, about Shaky the Robot. I'm happy to have Peter Hart here. I worked with him for Milestone that was dedicated back in 2017. We had a great event at the Computer History Museum, and um, it's an interesting story with regard to that. So how did SRI ask the government to build a robot in 1965? You know, that's a pretty, pretty lofty uh, expectation. And so they figured they would turn them down. So they used a code word, a mobile automaton. 
So when they asked for that, they got the money. And that's how they built the world's first mobile intelligent robot. So here's the actual letter that includes the words intelligent automata to reconnaissance. And so that's how Stanford Research Institute got the money back in 1965, a project that ran from 66 to 72. And then um, here's uh, Shaky, and with all the different parts of it identified. A lot of people look at that thinking, oh, it's a computer on wheels. Back then, you had computers like a mainframe Xerox computer running this. This is not a computer on wheels. But it, what it did is it moved around on those wheels and could look at its environment. And first time computer vision was done. So you have a camera that's actually able to discern objects, build up a database, and later travel around the same area and avoid those objects because it knows where they are based on the database that it has. So here's that computer that uh, was running um, Shaky the Robot. A similar one was running the Mother of All Demos uh, that I was just talking about. And here's a picture of um, when it was being developed. And Helen Chan Wolf is often called the Lady Ada Lovelace of robotics programming. Literally the first person to wrote, program a robot. And then here's... Um, Shaky's early learning environment. So we'd move around and find out where those objects were and build up the database and remember them and use that information later. And so here's an example of the computer vision techniques it was using. So there's an original photograph on the left of one of those objects, and we'd break it down and, and store it in the database. And there's here's an excerpt from uh, an article that was written about it calling it a machine with a mind of its own. And uh, here's things that we are using at probably... You know, to this day, right now, whenever you're using something like Google Maps and you're navigating from point A to point B, the technique that is the basis for that algorithm came from Shaky the Robot, from the techniques that it was learning. Also, the, the stay in lane technology that you'll often use on cars, that also came from Shaky the Robot. So here's the original Shaky team. Uh, the person uh, second from the right is Peter Hart, who's sitting up here in the fourth row. And... Um, Here's the team, the uh, members who were at the uh, 2017 dedication of, of, of this at the Computer History Museum. You notice a little poster on the left. They made it to look like kind of like a Bill Graham Fillmore concert poster. And also, you can find the one and only Shaky in the Computer History Museum. So it's the centerpiece of the um, um, Revolutions exhibition within the AI and robotics portion of the uh, ex exhibit. And I set up a website, shakymilestone.com, with everything you might want to ask about Shaky. Another milestone is uh, birthplace of Silicon Valley. So this is over at the corner of San Antonio Road and, and California Avenue. If you ever go by there, you'll see these three tall little statuettes, so to speak. Two of them are diodes, and one is a transistor. And these are re replicas of what were actually produced by Shockley Transistor back in the latter part of the 50s. And then uh, on the other side of that building, uh, there's one for Moore's Law. And here's a silicon um, crystal in the middle of a fountain with the plaque mounted at the edge of that fountain. They kept the original 391 San Antonio Road address, which is where Shockley Labs was. That's also, if you ever went to Pacific Stereo back in the 80s and 90s, it was in that same location where Shockley Labs was. And uh, the, uh, the planar process and integrated circuit uh, it was created by Fairchild. There's uh, on Charleston Road near 101 in San Antonio. There's a California State Historical Marker number 1000, as well as a uh, IEEE milestone plaque. Another example is Slack, just real close to us here, um, for the work that they did. And this is an example of a milestone that, uh, in conjunction with the American Society of Mechanical Engineers, the two together created this milestone plaque. And also uh, the Dialogue Online System. I believe that. Um, uh, Roger Summit is here. I'm not sure if he's in this audience. I know he'll be with us Monday at the Computer History Museum. But he created this uh, at Lockheed. And this actually was a search system that was ahead of any search system on the internet by over two decades. And it's actually still in use to this day. You, you have to pay to use it, but companies like pharmaceutical companies that want to do their research work for new uh, products they're making, they want to have vetted information and they're willing to pay for it. They use a uh, technology that came from this dialogue system. And one of the key things about it is able to do iterative search. When was the last time you went on the internet and actually did iterative searches? You really can't do it easily. So that's a key factor of this. And here's um, the original uh, lab with the, um, all the data storage on all those disk drives. Also, the Ampex videotape recorder. Did you know that Bing Crosby actually invested in, that, in Ampex because he loved to play golf? 
but recording his TV show was a conflict with his ability to play golf. So he invested in Ampex in Redwood City, and they created the, the first um, videotape recorders, and it got a standing ovation in 1957 when it was uh, presented. Um, and also with regard to the University of Utah and Evans and Sutherland, they established, um, with, again with uh, ARPA funding, uh, a center of excellence for computer graphics research, and um, a lot of amazing things were done there. Uh, John Warnock, who worked here, and also Alan Kay, who worked here, uh, were at this event. Alex, actually, Alan Kay via videotape. But Warn Warnock, five months later, passed away. So this is probably the last time publicly that he pre uh, presented. Another one I worked on with some of the people who also came out of the University of Utah uh, with regard to RenderMan. Here's Ed Catmull, co-founder of Pixar with Steve Jobs. And outside of Pixar, if you ever see that in Emeryville, there's a plaque you can see at the bottom. The one at the top, there's two plaques that are actually mounted there. One of them is for the work at Pixar for RenderMan. The one below that is for the University of Utah. And there's a, there's a wall of fame, as I like to call it, at the uh, Computer History Museum, where there's now 26 bronze plaques, including duplicates of the ones we're dedicating today and duplicates of the ones that will be dedicated on Monday. So I have a real hobby. Milestones have become my hobby, and I have fun doing this. So I'm happy to present for you today. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, so we're getting close to the main event now. So we're getting ready to unveil the milestone plaques. But let me first say that as a longtime park employee, I'm really pleased and honored to be here today so that we can celebrate these amazing impactful technologies, and more importantly, the people and the teams behind them. I think that's very much what you've heard uh, today. And it's uh, amazing to think about all of the impact that all of you here, many of you here, were able to create. And I just want to say on behalf of all SRI employees is that we're going to continue your legacy, and we're going to continue to invent the future in AI, education, quantum, security, privacy, health, climate, space, and many, many more areas. So very happy to be here and represent um, all of the employees here um, and at SRI. So now what we're going to do is um, get ready for the unveiling the plaques. The actual plaques are up in the lobby, which you'll be able to see later, um, but we're going to unveil them uh, virtually here. Uh, we have three readers of the plaques, and we're going to do them one at a time. So first, let me uh, introduce the first reader of the plaque, who's Ron Ryder. Uh, he'll be reading the milestone text of the laser printer. Uh, he joined Xerox Park in 1972. During his first few years here, he designed and prototyped a complete laser printing system, uh, which became the famous Xerox 9700 laser printer. He also invented the first instance of the ball mouse and was widely used as a pointing device on many computing systems. So thank you, Ron. And what we're going to do here is we're trying to add some drama here. So I'm going to, we don't have a drum roll, but I'm going to try to see, can you, yeah, like either stamp your feet like at a, like at a concert or a ball game. I don't know this place is super well constructed. So it may not, you may not be able to hear anything. So maybe, or you can, yeah, tap your, your thighs and, and let's try to get a little bit of uh, draw here. Going on. <laughs> Okay, ready. Let's do this. Um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> nice. Okay, so the development of the commercial laser printer from 1971 to 1977, Xerox Park researchers demonstrated the feasibility the feasibility of laser printing on a one page per second Xerox copier in 1971 and with computer generated images in 1972. As the networked printer in 1974, it transformed office automation and led to desktop publishing at PARC. The Xerox 9700 printer proved commercial viability in 1977 and helped launch the non-impact printer industry into a new era of printed communication for print shops, home, and office.
Thank, thank you, Ron. Okay, so for the next uh, reader, John Schock will be reading the milestone for the Alto personal computer. John joined Xerox Park while he was still an undergraduate at Stanford. He remained at Park until 1985, working with Ron Ryder, Bob Metcalf, Bob Taylor, and many others to develop the Office of the Future, most notably the Park Universal Packet Protocol that you heard about earlier. Um, he'll be uh, uh, he'll be reading the, the plaque. So what we're going to do again? Let's try to get a little bit more drama again. Give everyone some come on, wait! I can beat Ron. It's not a competition, but it's always a competition. Thank you, Lawrence. I, I was very flattered to be asked to read this and make no mistake, I know I'm channeling a bunch of other people, a very small group, uh, of course, Chuck Thacker, who's not with us any longer, uh, who developed the Alto, but then the dozens and hundreds of people, many of whom are in this room, who contributed to the ultimate development, growth, and success of the Alto. And therefore, I'm channeling all of you when I read this, uh, the, the, the contents of the plaque for those of you who didn't bring your glasses. The Xerox Alto established personal network computing in 1972 to 1983. Xerox Palo Alto Research Center researchers developed novel hardware and software for the Xerox Alto computer, setting the model for personal computing for decades. The Alto incorporated a high resolution display, mouse and park developed ethernet networking. Alto software developments in programming languages, graphical user interfaces, Printing, graphics, word processing, networking, and email were widely and profoundly influential. Thank you all. Thank you, John. And let's welcome back to the stage Bob Metcalf, who will be reading for Ethernet. So let's oh. give the same amount of one more time. All right, ready? All right, here we go. There you go. Oh. All right. The Ethernet wired LAN was invented at Xerox Palo Alto Research Center in 1973, inspired by the Aloha Network, Packet Radio Network, and the ARPANET. In 1980, Xerox DEC and Intel published a specification for a 10 megabit per second Ethernet over coaxial cable that became the IEEE 802.3-1985 standard. <laughs> Later augmented for higher speeds and twisted pair optical and wireless media, Ethernet became ubiquitous in home, commercial, industrial, and academic settings worldwide. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Thank you, Bob. I'd like to welcome David back to the stage. Uh, we're going to be joint. David will be joining Ron, John, and Bob for a discussion, and uh, we'll also be able to take the questions. So, if you haven't uh, done that yet, if you have any more questions, uh, please write them down, and we'll pick them up, and then I'll go through those. Okay, great. So, let me hand it off to David. Thank you, Lawrence. I know many of you turn in questions. We're going to turn to those in a moment, but first, let me start the conversation. I mean, we're all honored to be here. Uh, with so many people who've invented what we live today. I was thinking of um, what you were saying earlier, but don't do it alone, Bob. And, I, and maybe uh, John or Ron, comment a little bit more, you know. So I know your stories could fill the whole afternoon, but maybe what stands out in your mind of how laser printer or what was done with regard to Alta would not have been possible doing it alone. Who were the key people there? Uh -huh. Wants to start. Sure. sure. So um, collaboration was the number one thing that I noticed at at Park. Um, I was hired to build a character generator for Gary Starkweather's laser printer, and um, and well, I'd never built a character generator. I'd never even thought about a character generator. Um, I came from the physics community, and um, but Butler Lamson, he had thought a lot about uh, character generators. He had algorithms for how to sort characters, how to compress characters, and all sorts of things. And so whenever you wanted to do something at Park, if you didn't know how to do it, there was somebody who could help you, and they were always willing 
to spend the time and help you do things. So it was Gary Starkweather, Chuck Thacker, right. Butler Lampson. Uh, Bob and I wrote software together for the first laser printer system. Um, so everybody worked together. Let me add to that sort of a couple of stories on one on, on each side that I, part of the culture at Park, and although there are a bunch of individuals who were incredibly smart, and I was blessed to show up there as an undergraduate. And the, you know, you, you could contribute to something, you could get drawn into something, you'd have a conversation over the coffee pot. And there was a fair amount of flexibility. So I started out working with Alan Kay on small talk, writing graphics programs on a data general Nova. And as things evolved and Bob had started work on the ethernet and the first couple of boards became available. And the problem was, well, okay, we got three machines. I think one was yours, one was a Nova that we had and there was an Alto. And the question was, how are we gonna write some software to connect these things? And I was like, I mean, I'm sort of a software guy and in the education group. And, and I don't remember who introduced us, but somebody said, well, we need somebody to write some, you know, the, the end of the file transfer protocol that would be on the Nova, which was to be done in assembly language, and on the Alto, which was to be done in small talk. And so I just, you know, you Tom Sawyer, somebody hands you the paintbrush and you say, oh, I can paint that part of the fence for you. And and that's about how it happened, you know, that, and Bob sketched out the thing and I went off and tried to implement it and we managed to make the thing limp along. So it worked. And in a similar vein, so after the black and white laser printer that Gary had done and the print server that Ron had done. Gary Starkweather, who was in the optical sciences lab, had a an early color laser printer. I don't remember what engine it was on. And it was sort of, you know, printing color. It was on a 6500. Yeah. And, and he, ha he had sort of, it was printing some color bars or something, but there was really no imaging that you could put on it. And, and I actually have two memos, one of which says, you know, is addressed from me to Gary and a handful of other people. It says, hey, Gary, I really enjoyed our lunch. You know, I think it's a great idea. We ought to try to figure out how are we going to get some images to actually be able to print on this thing you've got. Let's see. Well, I can, you know, I can get so-and-so to change the graphics editing program that was done in small talk. And I can do a little work on the networking and somebody's got to connect the network link and we've got to define a simple-minded protocol for, or d definition of what the color image might look like. And maybe we could print something. And I think it might take two months. And Gary, who was a very distinguished senior guy, you know, and I, I was relatively young, wrote me back a really nice memo and copied in everybody in management, said, great idea, John, we need to do this, go for it. And, and it was the classic, you know, across labs and lots of different people. And Larry, Gary was an unbelievable cheerleader, you know, which is an important element of pushing technologies forward. And then I have a memo about two and a half months later where I apologize. And I said, I said, we could do this in two months. It took us about two and a half. We defined this silly little format. We modified the graphics program. We couldn't get the Ethernet on your machine. So we watched it. We, we walked the tape down to, to the color printer. And here's some printouts. And Bert Sutherland, who's my boss, you know, says, and George Paik, and who named this auditorium, I get back a note from Bert that says, great job, John. Send copies of that to George Paik so he can send it to corporate. And I'm like, oh, this is from a lunch with Gary Starkweather? So, anyways, yeah. and two examples of the cooperative culture and that we were working in the forefront of some projects that just nobody had seen before. Long and I imagine ahead. also enabled by being in the same place. Absolutely. Being in the building, running yeah. into people counts for something. Yeah. Let, let me pick up on something else that Bobby has said. Uh, one of the questions I often get asked leading research and all the amazing things people are doing is, what's next? What will be recognized 25 years from now? And as I've reflected on that, I've often thought about at the time the things we celebrate today were invented, I wonder if the folks who invented them thought that they were an inflection point and really envisioned all the things that would change. Maybe you did or didn't. So, Bob, you're wonderfully talking about Ethernet as a brand. Uh, so I'll give you an opportunity to expand a little bit on what you said. How do you see that evolving in the next 50 years? What will Ethernet represent? What else might be moved besides packets over this general construct and concept? Can I not answer that? Sure. Because <laughs> I'm dying to tell you about how I decided I should find out by buying a mile's worth of coaxial cable what the bits look like going in and coming out the other end. And I'm sitting in the bottom of building 84, uh, 34. 34. And I'm uh, trying to join some cables together. And I'd never really done it before. So I was drawing blood. <laughs> and this guy walks over and it's Dave Boggs. I, I didn't know his name. And 
he knew how to do connectors. So this is the volunteer to help thing. So he helped me put these connectors on the ends of the cable and build a thing. And from that interaction spun our two year uh, working on the ethernet that's going to do all those things that you just asked me about. <laughs> he, well, well trained in media, right? And that knew how to pivot. So let me turn to the questions. We have a question along the line of what I asked that you could pose to Bob. <laughs> I actually do have a question for Bob. Um, what was the most challenging part in the standardization of ethernet or increasing its adoption to win in the market? Well, standardizing uh, Ethernet was a strategy, and it stemmed from the antitrust division of the U.S. government, who in, whose lawyers said that DEC, Intel, and Xerox could not meet because it would be in restraint of trade. And I called up my fraternity brother, Howard Charney, oh, yeah. and asked Howard, oh, and Prior to this, Howard had spent two years suing IBM for antitrust. <laughs> so I asked Howard, what do I have to tell these lawyers so that we can meet? And he gave me a list of five things, not all of which I can remember. But one of them was, going back to your, I'm actually answering his question. <laughs> Howard gave me this list. You know, marketing people can't attend, you can't divide territories, you can't set prices. And you must have, a, oh, you must have a government observer at the meetings. And the last one was, it, you, your goal must be to do an open industry standard. Um, okay. So then we uh, said, well, how is this going to get standardized through the IETF? Oh, no. Uh, uh, IEEE 488 had just been standardized. Well, we thought. So we found the guy who did that, Don Lockery. May he rest in peace. And we asked him, how can we do a committee to standardize Ethernet the way you did for 488? And through the Christmas of 1979, we formed Project 802, which we're going to hear about uh, in the subsequent meetings. So it was Howard's in, in, uh, intervention with antitrust rules that made a really big breakthrough in getting Ethernet standardized. Uh, interesting playbook. Another question from the audience? Um, this is a question for the, well, for the entire uh, panel. With so many reasons why technologies are successful, you know, like timing, new innovations, people, relationships, what insights from your experiences and careers do you think are most valuable today for a young recent graduate? <laughs> I'm not really that old to be looked at for that kind of advice, am I? I don't see myself that way. I, you know, it's, you know, so many of the successes, well, let me put it the opposite way. There are so many wonderful technological advances that don't succeed. So what do we learn from those? Well, A, if they don't actually work, um, but more importantly, if they don't actually meet a need of individuals or businesses and find a market for them, um, and that takes time to figure out. So how do you match an innovation against its market? And there are, as I said, so many brilliant ideas that go nowhere or, or they're too early. You know? And so the, uh, Bob can tell you about his early work on neural networks 50 years before the current wave. And I've got, been through multiple cycles of AI investing where we sort of did okay before each successive AI winter you know, sort of wiped everything off. And all of a sudden you arrive at a point where the hardware, the software, the ideas have scaled up that a fundamental underlying idea was a failure in the marketplace 30 years earlier and 20 years earlier. And all of a sudden you have a hammer that's big enough to hit this particular nail. And all of a sudden everybody's a genius. And, and I wish I were one of those and I wish I'd invested in more of them. So, you know, part of it is, you know, to understand, and it's, it's sometimes hard for people who are, who are only focused on the underlying technology that you can have a, a great technological advance and then you sort of have to match it to the reality of the marketplace and so on. And then there's a whole bunch of luck and other things on timing and market size and other things that I, I wish I knew how to predict. I, I do more great investments in great companies, but I'm not that smart. The expression that I use to agree with you mm -hmm. is to be innovative, you have to think out of the box. Mm -hmm. 
to get scale, you have to get your innovation back into the box. Uh, <laughs> so we had Ethernet and we were trying to sell it to people. And they say, what's it good for? And we say, it's, it's general purpose. It could do almost anything. Those packets can carry anything you want. That is not an answer that customers look for. <laughs> so we came up with, through trial and error, PFMTS. Mm -hmm. This software will print, print file. share files, send emails, do remote Terminal. terminal operation, and uh, S was stubs, which was our word for API. Yeah. So we did a P we discovered PFMTS is what the customer wanted. So when they, when they told what's it do, you can share that expensive printer, you can uh, uh, rule the world. So when you said that, I couldn't help but think that our communications team is going to take your words. You know, when you look at our logo about thinking outside the box and bringing it back into the box so people can use it, I thought a wonderful pivot yeah. there. But Ron, any, anything else you? Yeah, I I just think of all of the times that people have told me or others that it can't be done, it's not possible, and you know it can be done. And so don't be discouraged by the naysayers because there are more naysayers than people who are willing to try things. Just go for it. Another question? Okay, here's another question. Um, in the 70s, there was corporate funded research, right? Yeah, here at Park, but also a lot of government funded research. So even though the world today is very different, can you share any lessons that you learned from maybe back then, how and to now, how corporations and the government can work together really on big ideas? Mm -hmm. Are there any easy questions? Yeah. They might so, want to pass that to Ben. We are in uh, we are in the midst, we are all in the midst of Silicon Valley. Silicon Valley is a set of practices and terminology and like adult supervision is one of my favorite terms of art. And it comes from if someone had written a book on the Silicon Valley trade craft, it would have adult supervision in it. And so I think that's a partial answer to your question is to replicate or expand or leverage the Silicon Valley mob. So I'm going to touch on a couple of different things. The, um, you know, over the years and, and, and much of my contact has been with Stanford, but other universities as well. And Mac Beasley was a professor of material science who worked on a, uh, on superconductors. And we did a superconducting company that we spun out of there, which was one of my longest on, on ultimately great successes, but a long 18 year slog. And, you know, he used to lecture me that, Technology transfer is a body transfer is a body contact sport, mm -hmm. and by by which he meant that you know I mean we you know we could get technology we could license things and the best thing we got from Mac was two of his best graduate students who came and joined and really were part of the founding team. So at a very fundamental level, I'm going to argue that you know government support of research in universities that produces not only the ideas and, and we focus on a lot of licensing of innovations, but the human product much of which is directly, maybe indirectly, but in many cases directly funded by the federal government is a is a, an incredibly important combination. Now, where it gets tricky is in the middle ground of how do you do individual projects? How do you work with government labs? How do you spin off things from government labs? The measurement criteria for success in the government labs and their spin off, which is sort of subject to, you know, you know, there was a whole thing about the crater program, the commercial R and D, and and how labs got credit or didn't get credit. So they were desperately spinning off any idea because they got to put a tally mark, and it's like, oh, this is really a crazy way to do things. And and the third and final op observation at a very high level, and I don't know what to think about this. We are this experiment is being run in real time at huge scale in the current program for the government to help rebuild the semiconductor industry, and and I. I, I, I am unable to have an opinion about how well that's going to work, but I understand that it is really big and it is really important and I wish everybody well. And we're going to have to watch, you know, it's going to take 10 years before we know whether that worked. And it's, uh, it's unbelievably important and uh, I can't uh, judge what's going to happen. I hope it works. Ron, did you want to add? Or? I don't know anything to add to that one. It's, it's hard to give advice that, SRI on a subject like this because yeah. we've been at it since well we're the same age uh, 1946 <laughs> uh, 
but here's a here's I've tried to get technology out of the seven uh, DOE is it seven DOE energy labs, and they've invited the my VC partners and others to come and go shopping among the technologies they've developed, and they have immense stores of unused technology, and then we would find one, and we would try to spin it out, and they would try to license us the patents. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, and we would say no. Smart VCs don't invest in patents generally. They invest in people. So why don't you learn, uh, lend us the people for a year or two as founders of the company and they'll have st stock options and all that Silicon Valley stuff. And they wouldn't part with the people. And that's that was, yeah. so if you can figure out how to get them to part with the people just for a year or two, yeah. big breakthrough. Yeah, yeah. Really yeah. we have some examples of that with uh, in the room, Adam and Siri spun out yep. from SRI and came back and back and forth. And I think that, Often when you try to hang on too long or try to own too much, there's not enough to share and you don't get that spun out. Um, did you have a oh, comment? Yep, sure. Uh, I just got a microphone. Hey, yeah. there you go. <laughs> I'm, I'm, wearing, I'm wearing one. Too. Yeah, but okay. yeah. Now I got two of them, so you can't shut me up. I, <laughs> I actually wanted to reinforce this uh, idea that technology doesn't transfer, people transfer. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's so vital to take people who understand how this stuff works and turn them loose on actually making something happen. You know, engineering is the straightforward process by which science fiction turns into reality, mm -hmm. but it takes people to do that. And if you just track all of the things that have been successful, well, to take an example of Ethernet, Bob had to leave to go start a company, brought some people with him and made it happen. So that's a really important lesson for all of us to keep in. So I was thinking about the inventions that many of you developed, and some of them were using daily, like Ethernet. Many people in the room may no longer have a laser printer, but yet the technology that's there is being used conceptually in things like pharmaceutical printing and manufacturing. Um, one of my colleagues, and you've heard people talk about with the advent of large language models and what it's enabling people to do, the question posed about all the programming we did, would people in the future need to actually know how to program? Or could they ask a question and the code comes out? So my question to you is, as you think about how AI is transforming so much and how we do what we do, how do you think the very fundamental notion of invention might change with tools like are emerging today being brought to the foundational idea as opposed to simply improving it? <laughs> Over to you. All right. Well, let's get the printer guy to do it. <laughs> oh, here we go. Thank oh, you, Vince. Right. Bail us out. Uh, this, this is your member of the Lifeline. They're, they've used two <laughs> Lifeline. I never turned down an open mic. Okay. <laughs> so I have some experience with large language models. I mean, Google has been very much involved in the history and development of all that stuff. And I've been trying to understand how they work and how they don't work. And so I tried an experiment. I decided to get one of the large language models to write an obituary for me. <laughs> now, I know that sounds kind of sad, but I figured obituaries are found on the internet all the time because people die and people write obituaries about them. So I figured the large language models would have uh, ingested that for me. And there's some stuff about me on the internet. So I, I asked it to do that. And there's this 700 word um, obituary and it starts out the way you'd expect. You know, we're sorry to report Dr. Sir passed away. And it gave a date that was a little too early as far as yeah. I know. <laughs> <laughs> and then, and then went on to describe my career, but it gave me credit for stuff I didn't do. And it gave yeah. Yeah. other people credit for stuff I did. <laughs> And then it got to the family members part and it made up family members. <laughs> yeah. And so I'm scratching my head trying to figure out how the hell is this happening? And so my little cartoon model about where we are with large language models is as uh, facile and original and, uh, and generative as they are, they don't fully have context. So if, if uh, Bob's bio and my bio were on the same web page somewhere. Mm -hmm. The system would ingest both of, the, of them and then uh, build virtual um, uh, probabilities 
of the words or the tokens, as they call it, uh, how they might interact with each other and how close they might be in the generative output. And so it's easy to see how the system would generate stuff that it had plucked from different contexts and didn't know that it was drawing on you know, a counterfactual output from factual information. We still have a ways to go to figure out how to do that. And the current practice, which I barely understand, is to pre-prompt the thing in order to put it in some sort of a state so that when it does answer the prompt, it is more likely to produce factual output, but we're still a long ways from making that happen. Thank so uh, be careful what you bet on. Yeah. Well, maybe at a future park forum, we'll feature some of the folks who are living 20 years in the future as they're thinking about what tools are beyond large language models and how all this will come and wonderful answer. Thank you. Uh, so we're now, if I take on one more question between the audience and food. So let me ask Lawrence, is there a really good question in the stack that you have? That <laughs> oh, good. Would... Well, this is a fun question. I think I, think, I like this and it could be short, which is, what is the wildest technology you had tried or helped or worked on that no one knows about or no one talks about? <laughs> <laughs> and you've used up all your lifelines, so you must answer. <laughs> well, you know, I. It, it, you know, my, my worst, as people know, I spent the first third of my career at Xerox and the latter two thirds in the venture capital business. But the venture capital business is pretty pragmatic. I mean, you know, the, I mean, I, you know, if my biggest mistakes in venture capital were generally being too early, you know, a, a good idea, a reasonable market. And, but by the time you, you spend the first couple rounds of money, you find out that technology is not quite as far as along as you thought and that yeah. the market is much further out than you thought. And you know, I had an early deal that uh, combined uh, cell phones with mapping technology and um, you know feedback from users. And so it, it had we had a couple of little prototypes. My favorite one was where to find a public bathroom. So and and th this was this was one of our sample use cases. Was you know you're a mom with a baby and you're in San Francisco and you need a bathroom and you can pull out your phone and you have user generated content that says the bathroom in Macy's in the back left corner is a really clean one. And this was really cool. And I thought we were going to knock the cover off the ball. And we were about 10 years too early before Google Maps, user-generated content, you know, great idea and just way too early, clunky, hard to build, couldn't get the advertising model. We shut the thing down. So, you know, if, if anything that I did was that far out, I probably wasn't doing my job very well. Now I have personally invested in a fusion power deal, which is a, which you know, which is maybe in the, I hope it's not in this category, you know, and, and it. Are you expecting it next month? No, no. I've but, invested in fusion. And Commonwealth little, Fusion out of. Uh, that's the one I invested in. Yeah. Uh. <laughs> I, I, this is a startup that's raised several billion dollars. Unbelievable. Not an AI startup. Yeah. <laughs> so this is not directly relevant to the question, but I do have a wonderful story. about. So I said I, 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 I've lived through investments in two generations of superconducting circuits. Hypris, which was an early one out of IBM, which was in the four degree Kelvin, and then the high temperature uh, one where Mac Beasley and some of the team helped us. And, and I spent 18 years. We were in and out of it three times near-death experiences repeatedly and i swore and, and we got out and did fine except i can't tell you how many sleepless nights i had and and i swore i would never do a superconducting deal a material science deal these are all way too hard and some friends were, well, isn't fusion one of those yes so <laughs> fusion fusion and this is a story about the venture capital business and about entrepreneurship and about ideas so i'm i'm like oh no 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 so some friends come john you know all about superconductivity we use superconducting tape to make the uh, the magnets. You'd you'd be a great advisor and investor. Come help us. And I said, "Are you kidding? I got, I I know way too much about this." <laughs> and and they finally said, "No, no, John, it'll be great." And I said, "Okay, I'll make one phone call. I'm going to call the guy who did the superconducting tape at Conductus and spent PhD out of Cornell, spent 18 years at it, and I'm sure he's going to tell me how stupid this idea is." 
And, and I call him up and I start to describe the situation. And he goes, John, you got to stop. Yeah. He said, I said, why? He said, I'm working for the company. Uh, <laughs> I said, what? He said, oh yeah, I read about what they were doing. They were buying all this superconducting tape. And I went to them and said, I can build it for you, but you need to give me this huge amount of money in this huge factory. Now, this is like you call, you ask the waiter in a restaurant, what's the best thing on the menu? And he tells you, and then what, you don't take his advice? So I called him up. The guy said he's voted with his feet. He's working there. And, and, and everything tells me this is an incredibly risky, although actually fairly far along in fairness. But in, you know, so it's about as far in the future as I'm, I've ever been able to think. But the but, beauty of this company is they're building a, a tokamak, which is a fusion reactor. Yeah. And you, you can see it. It's like 30 feet across. But getting the reactor to work, which is what all the other fusion companies are focused on, these guys aren't focused on that. They expect their this reactor is going to work. They're building ten thousand reactors. That they're approaching, like in the in the design of the of the uh, mag, uh, superconducting tapes. Yeah. Uh, how can we build these really cheaply at Q at quantity ten thousand? And that's what I like about this company. Yeah. So as, as we think they were coming here to celebrate the inflection points of the past and about a potential inflection point of the future and continue the conversation at the reception, but to give our printer guy the last word. Um, Ron, you know, maybe of things that you worked on, are there some ideas that you think still have merit that it'd be great if someone picked it up, right? Or well, something along that line. I mean, it's interesting. I spent my entire career at Xerox um, almost entirely in laser printing and um and we did lots of different things and we switched to high quality very fast color printers um i think the hardest thing at xerox was trying to convince them um, that they needed a system architecture mm -hmm. for how they were going to build things and that was an example of it was too soon for them to um, get that. And so I was their architect for a while, but failed at that. So as Lawrence comes back up to tell you how to find food without needing the A-star algorithm or a map on your phone, um, Lawrence, please uh, close our event. Yes, thank you to uh, all our speakers. Please join me in so what we're going to do is we're going to, so the speakers are going to go up to the reception. Let's give them some time to be able to make their way up there. So please stay in your seats and then I'll close and give you the logistics in terms of how to get there. So um, thank you again to Great. our speakers and we'll look forward to seeing you upstairs in the reception.